So, uh, welcome to this week's Keeping Current. We have uh, the one uh, discussion today. It's not a lecture, it's a discussion. And uh, it's on technical publication. The ins, the outs, the goods, the bads, and so on. So take it away, Drs. Goldsmith, Jacobs, and Calvert. Hello. So imagine us sitting at a table at the front of the room for a panel discussion. So I wanted to start by talking about what does it mean to publish in a peer-reviewed venue? So I want to talk a little bit about the process of getting a paper reviewed. If you submit a paper to a legitimate journal, it goes to an editor who presumably knows something about the field. The editor has th then sends it out to reviewers. My experience of an editor is you send it out to anywhere from three to a dozen reviewers in order to get three reviews. Um, at which point those reviews come in and the editor makes a decision. The reviews should address, is the paper on topic for the journal? Is it correct? Is it new? Or are you just reproducing somebody else's results and occasionally somebody else's prose? And is it readable? The editor can decide to reject it out of hand, accept it as it is, almost never happens, or they can ask for minor revisions or a major rewrite based on the, the reviewers. Typically, you get one rewrite that can go to a reviewers again, maybe the same, maybe different, and then either it's accepted or not. Occasionally, with journals, particularly for special issues where they really want the paper, you can go through multiple rewrites. And at each stage, the, the editor has a chance to reject. So presumably that means when you see a paper in a legitimate journal that at least three people who do research in that area agree that it should be published more or less in the shape that it's in. Okay, this process can take anywhere from three months to well over a year. Um, Dr. Clapper in the background just muttered, it can take as much as five years. That's rare. I've had a paper take two and a half years to get to publication. If you want quick turnaround, you submit to a conference. The conference has prepared a set of reviewers before the papers come in, or at least a set of program committee members who may farm out, out the papers to reviews. And most conferences in computer science go through one round of reviewing and accept possibly with requests for, review, for revisions or they reject. Typically, they do not check whether the revisions are made if the paper is accepted. Typically, conferences again have three reviewers looking at the paper. Um, I'm seeing some of my colleagues smile about things like they don't check whether um, the revisions are made. So conferences have a less rigorous reviewing process that's much faster. Um, typically from sub initial submission to conferences four to six months, there's variation. I keep saying legitimate conference, legitimate journal. There are also journals out there that are for profit. And the way they work is you submit something, they accept it, and then they send you a large bill. By large bill, I mean hundreds to thousands of dollars. Um, there's a fabulous paper called Get Me Off Your Fucking Mailing List. It was accepted within a few days of submission with reviews. 
which allegedly came from peers, peer researchers. They say, this looks fine, publish. The entire content of the submission was that sentence repeated. There was a graph, there was a diagram, and otherwise it was that sentence. That's not the sort of journal that we would consider legitimate. It's hard to tell which are which. I recommend using um, one of the lists online of predatory journals, journals and conferences and publishers. So that's a little bit about the reviewing process. There are also a number of places that you can submit a paper that will put it on the web that are not reviewed. The most common, which I think Dr. Jacobs will talk about is archive. There are some social networks for research like ResearchGate, academia.edu, um, I'm not sure what else. Those simply accept papers and allow people to comment on them, but they are not peer reviewed. The, you, well, I'll let Dr. Jacobs talk about when, why and when you should submit to those. So that's my introduction to this. Um, any questions? Okay, Dr. Jacobs. Cool. Um, good, thanks for, for getting this all started. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I will um, try to set this up so I can monitor the chat. Um, all right, looks I can like do I'm. that if you'd like. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess I would just encourage <clears throat> encourage people to throw questions into um, the chat window as I'm going through this. And Judy, feel free to to interrupt. Um, so uh, you know, I, I was tasked with um, presenting a little bit about. Um, how to use archive. Um, and so this is what I came up with. Um, it's a little bit sort of trying to um, write out a little bit of the framework for how I think about using archive. Um, but just in general, what archive is, um, it's a website that's been maintained, I believe by Cornell uh, for many years. Um, you can upload either a PDF or the LaTeX for a paper. Um, and as long as you have privileges to upload or you can get somebody to vouch for you. Uh, you can upload your um, article there and you can provide some classification for it. So we typically will post to cs.cv because uh, you know most of the work that I'm publishing there is in the computer vision, uh, sorry, uh, uploading there is in the computer vision area. Um, and um, so I think the sort of important things to think about, you know, if, if or how you use archive one or what are the norms of your research community. So every community is a little bit different. Um, and so I'll talk about this from the perspective of the computer vision community, um, but a lot of the same things will overlap, but I didn't want to try to, to talk about it much more broadly because I don't publish in some of these other areas. So I can imagine, for example, that, you know, research in theory might be quite a bit different in terms of how uh, they choose to use archive. Um, and then what are the motivations and risks? And then where exactly does archive fit in the publication process that uh, Dr. Goldsmith just talked about? So, um, so I thought I would start out with talking a little bit about the, so one of my main conferences is uh, CDPR. It's Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition. It's an IEEE conference. Um, and they've been wrestling with the increasing use of archive in the community for I'd say the last 10 years. Um, and so every year they, you know, they'll make small changes to the policies that they um, provide as guidance to authors submitting papers and to the reviewers who are going to assess the, the, the work. Um, and so this was um, sort of a snapshot and I edited out some of the, um, what didn't seem like it was essential, but this is, you know, a couple of slides uh, summarizing the CDPR 2020 policy. So, the first um, is to define what it means for something to be a publication, um, because you know, as the reviewers are looking at at a particular document, sorry, my phone's going off in the background. 
uh, as they're looking at a particular document, they're, you know, they're looking at related work and trying to understand how this new work they're evaluating compares. Um, and so the reviewers are instructed to compare to other publications. So anything that is a written work uh, that is longer than four pages that has been submitted for peer review counts as a publication. Um, and it has to have been accepted. So, um, you know, if it doesn't meet those criteria, it's not a publication. And so it's not something that you technically need to um, consider as, you know, previous work that, um, you know, minimizes the, the value of the contribution to the new work. Um, and it doesn't really depend, you know, this, this last pit, bit here has changed. Um, you know, there, there used to be this sort of distinction between whether something counts as a publication or not. So you'll have workshops that might accept papers, uh, but then they don't get put into some archival um, location like IEEE Explore. Um, so that, that sort of piece has kind of gone away. And now it's just, is it four pages uh, or longer? And was it accepted? If, if that's the case, then it's a publication. Otherwise, it's not. Um, so basically, archive.org papers do not count as a publication because they can't be rejected. Um, and so that leads to these questions of when you're reviewing somebody's work um, and then there's an archive paper that's related to that, how do you deal with the fact that there's this other work that came out before the work that you're reviewing? Um, and so then, you know, as you're an author sort of getting ready to submit your paper, you have to decide whether to cite an archive paper. Um, and so these are some of the rules associated with that. So you do not, you're not required to compare to recent archive reports. So basically if a paper doing something similar to your paper came out a month or two before the submission deadline, um, then you don't technically need to cite that unless your work was inspired by that work, right? And so this is where there's a little bit of, you know, gray area because people might choose to withhold that information um, about what inspired their work. Um, and then your paper cannot be rejected from CVPR um, if it doesn't cite or beat the performance in an, in an archive work. Um, and then... Um, Could I jump in a moment? Yeah, sure. The reason that you don't have to beat the results in archive work is anybody could claim results and put it up in archive. So until it's been peer reviewed, we don't consider it to be validated in any, in any way. Right, right. So that peer reviewing process is um, what CVPR is using as a way to assess the validity of the claims in, you know, some publication. Um, so, and, and it's an interesting, it's been an interesting uh, thing in the computer vision community because a lot of people are posting things earlier and earlier in the publication process to archive. People are building on those works using the associated code long before the paper ever comes out at a conference. Um, and um, so it, it leads to these challenges where people are um, building upon things that haven't been published yet. Um, so. Um, and this is just a small point here that if you're citing something from archive, this was a problem for a little while where people were citing things from archive and never citing the, th the, the actual accepted version of the publication. So it might have come out in CDPR two years after it was released to archive. So people keep started citing the archive version. Um, and then I think the, the last point is an important one that, you know, the reviewer is supposed to try to assess whether there's some plagiarism or academic dishonesty taking place. So because of the way the rest of the policy works, somebody could submit, um, essentially grab an archive paper and submit it as their own or grab big pieces of it. And because that archive paper is not a publication, it's not something that you can compare against. And so there's this sort of uh, ability, if you think something is plagiarized, to be able to, to, to factor that in, but you have to work with the, the rest of the review committee to, to make that decision. So anyway, I said some of those things just because I wanted to provide some, some perspective, um, because any choice that I make in terms of whether I submit to archive sort of comes back to these policies. So I want to make sure that the things that we're doing sort of line up nicely with these policies. And so for whatever research community you're in, you should understand the, the archive policies for the venues that you're submitting into, because Every community can sort of arrive at different policies. Um, 
but getting back um, to some of the key issues here, right? so what, what are the motivations for submitting to archive? Um, and I think one of them is the sort of broad benefit of faster scientific progress. Um, and so within the computer vision community, you're able to, you know, instead of waiting for CVPR, which is in June, people might release it the, you know, October or November before. And so you can see that work. If you know it's good, you can build upon it. And so the, the community as a whole can move faster. Um, and so, so that works really nicely. Um, if these are, you know, things that can be empirically evaluated, you know that they work well and you can build upon them. Um, some people use it to avoid being intellectually scooped. So if you've got a, you know, if you know there's some sort of race going on for a particular idea and you happen to get it working um, before somebody else does, uh, you might post it to archive so that you can claim that you, you finished that first. Um, there's a marketing benefit. So, you know, papers that are posted to archive get seen by a lot of people. There are lots of different services that, you know, retweet archive papers and, and all these sorts of things. And it also makes it easier for you to then share your work with other people because it might take the publisher, you know, three or four months after the conference uh, before they actually post the paper publicly. And so instead of sharing it on your own site, you can share it on archive where you'll know that there'll be a permanent URL that's good um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so there's also this ability to get rapid feedback to improve a manuscript. And this isn't something that I typically do, but in some communities, this is more uh, a standard practice. So you, you put it to archive, you share it with people, they give you feedback, you make improvements and you upload an improved version. Um, there's also so that you can cite the work. So you might have another paper that's coming out that builds upon this previous work and you want to be able to cite it um, but it's not come out in the conference yet, so it's a little hard to cite. And so sometimes we'll do things where we, you know, push it to archive just so we can cite it in another paper uh, because, you know, there's some technique in that previous paper. Um, archive is nice because it's easy. It's sort of like um, version control uh, because there's a version number associated with each uh, version that you upload of a given paper. So, you, you know, if there's a mistake in your accepted conference paper, you can make a correction there and that's easy to track. Um, and then the last reason for us to, is sort of publishing something uh, that, you know, we didn't quite get it accepted somewhere. We don't really want to try to push it to a lower tier venue, but we just want to be done with it. Uh, and so sometimes we'll do this where we are, you know, we're like, we, we've got this thing, we think it's interesting, people might like it, but it's not worth the extra effort of submitting it to some lower tier venue. Um, and so sometimes we've done that so that we can sort of use it as a way to put a stamp on it and move on. Um, Anyway, I think there, there are probably other motivations, but that I tried to sort of dump some of the thoughts that, that we use for why. Um, I think there are some risks um, associated with this. So you might have your uh, paper scooped. Um, so suppose that you submit to CVPR in November, you submit your paper to archive also at the same time. Somebody else can see that idea, build upon it, submit that to the next conference deadline, which maybe is in March. Um, and suppose that your paper gets rejected from CVPR, then their paper that's basically using your ideas gets to come out first uh, in a conference. And so there's some risks associated with, you know, who gets um, credit for some of that. Um, there's also sort of what I call agenda scooping. So if you've got, you know, there's a paper that breaks some new ground and there's a lot of research that might flow out of that um, and, and you put very clear future work section to that. So you might have people come and, you know, build upon your work and do the future work that you planned to do. Um, I think there's a risk for, you know, some potential embarrassment if you post something there that you're not really proud of and that there's got some issues with it. You know, that's something that's going to be there in public um, forever. Um, and then there's some issues with anonymization, de-anonymization. So the CVPR reviewing process is double blind um, anonymized. And so if you post something to archive and the reviewers see it, then they will know who you are. Um, and so there's challenges there, um, positive and negative. Um, so this is, I've got a couple slides here that just sort of lay out and Judy laid out some of these things, but I thought I would just sort of, I had this picture in my head to try to talk about sort of when you decide uh, to submit um, and so just sort of starting at the top, this is sort of the, the, the workflow for submitting to CVPR. You might 
you know, draft one, you might have something that you would be willing to share with the world. It's not maybe fully ready to submit for peer review. Maybe there's some improvements that you might make, but there's this sort of first draft. Then there's the version that you want to submit. Then you submit it for review. You get some reviewer feedback. Then there's a decision made. Then you have to create your camera ready copy, which is based on the review feedback. And then you present it at the conference. Right? And so people can choose to submit to archive anywhere along this workflow, um, you know, generally not before draft number one, um, often probably after draft number two uh, is a pretty common place. Um, but this is sort of the workflow. Um, and I think the key question is sort of deciding when you should submit that to archive. Right? And for me, it, it depends on lots of different factors and it's often a debate with the, the co-authors. Um, but this is typically when we do it, you know, so after we've received the final decision uh, from the organizers that a paper will be accepted, um, then we generally will start preparing it to submit to archive. Um, and so often it's pretty close to the camera ready submission deadline. We'll submit right. it to archive as well. What is camera ready? What does that entail? This is a question from chat. Okay, yeah, sure. So um, you've got a, a review copy that you submit that the reviewers look at the, uh, you know, the organizers, you know, look at the reviews, make a decision about acceptance. They provide you some feedback um, about things they'd like to see improved. And then basically the camera ready copy is you going back through giving a very serious editing pass to fix some of the bugs that didn't get fixed in the paper. Um, and maybe adding extra experiments that the reviewers wanted to see. Um, you know, making sure that the lines line up nicely, there aren't orphaned lines or any of these sorts of things, all of that little final polish that doesn't really affect the review process, um, but you know, you want the, the document to look good. And so then you submit that camera ready copy. Uh, I mean, I think this, uh, you know, this is, harkens back to the days when you probably were, at some point somebody was taking a picture of the document and you were getting it ready for that. But this is just the, the final published version of that document is the camera ready. Um, so there's a there's always a deadline for that. It might be three or four weeks after the acceptance notification. So, um, so if it's accepted, you go through that, you you build that, and then you send that to the organizers of the conference so that they can compile that in some way. Um, so we'll typically you know submit to archive somewhere between the final decision and the presentation at the conference, um, so that we can post to social media to market and do those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes if the paper was rejected and we just don't want to work on it anymore, but we still like the paper, we think it's got value. So we might also submit that to archive at that point, even if it was rejected, or we might go back and, you know, start this whole process over again. Um, so some people choose to submit to archive up here. So in the sort of first and second draft stage, because they're very confident that the work is good. Um, you know, they you know they know for sure it's going to get accepted, or even if it's not, they don't really care too much because they just want to, you know, get that work um, noticed. Uh, and so I think a lot of people will um, post there, and we we do that occasionally, but that's not something that we do very often. Um, and there are critiques of people that uh, do that in that you know they might be trying to take advantage of their name recognition um, to be able to get more attention for their work. Um, or that it might be to influence the review process in some way. Um, but I think generally there's this sort of place in between where it's generally bad form to submit to archive. So after you've submitted it for review and before you get the final decisions, uh, that's generally considered bad form because you know it's while the reviewers are looking at your paper, you submit it to archive, um, then the sort of the, the rationale isn't really there. You should either do that before the review process or after you, you get it accepted so that it doesn't have that perception of manipulating the review process. So anyway, that was um, my brain dump of thinking about archive, when to use it, when not to use it, uh, and how my group tends to think about that. So I'm happy to have questions or just to pass it back to Dr. Goldsmith. Let me ask you a question about, uh, again, about camera ready. Often the conference or the publication will require a particular format. Uh, can you say something about uh, accommodating requests for particular formats? 
So the venues that we typically publish in, so the, the conferences, the CVPR, ICCD, ECCD, um, typically the, the version that you submit for the review process is essentially the same as the version for the, you know, the, the format is the same as the version for the final uh, camera ready, except there might be a flag in the LaTeX that says, is this a review copy or not? And really often all that does is it puts line numbers in place so that it's easy to review. Um, so the distinction between camera ready and the review copy is very, very small for most of our work. Um, it's just that we put some extra effort into polishing it up. Um, and then we will often just submit the PDF that we generate from that um, copy and then they'll validate it to make sure it meets the standards. Um, but for, for most of the things that we submit to, we have a LaTeX template that we use um, that's provided by the venue. Um, when you're submitting to a journal, uh, you know, every journal has some different procedures, uh, which I find incredibly frustrating. Um, where you might have to take your review copy and break it all into lots of different pieces in different ways, um, you know, upload your figures separately. Um, and so that, that can be um, a little bit of a frustrating process, but that's because the, these, these journals are going to then compile that together with a bunch of other documents into one big document, essentially. So they need to have it in pieces that they can re put back together. For the conferences that we submit to, it generally that PDF just ends up on a web page somewhere. So it doesn't have to be sort of integrated in with other things. Um, so the camera ready preparation process for uh, journals is typically uh, more involved. It might take several days of um, renaming files, you know, generating separate figures um, and such. Do people still accept uh, Microsoft Word documents or is it all moving now to LaTeX? I was going to um, say, I mean, if the conferences, the venue, the, the conferences anyway that I submit to, they, they always have both a LaTeX and a Word template. So you, a lot of people do it in Word. I don't know how, but somehow they do. Yeah, so at, at CVPR um, or, or the sort of associated conferences, um, there is a generally a word template, um, you know, and, you know, I, I review quite often for those. And I would say maybe one out of 40 papers uses the word template. And it's really obvious. Um, and, you know, I think there's a somewhat negative perception that comes with those because they just don't the, the typesetting is not as nice. Um, but, um, and I don't know that I have seen a, an accepted CVPR, ICCV, ECCV paper that um, appears like it used the word template uh, in, in a long time. So, um, but that's certainly, that's a, a community specific thing. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Okay, there's time for questions at the end, but we're gonna turn this over to Dr. Calvert for a minute or two. Okay, uh, well, uh, maybe a more, I have, I ended up with a bunch of bullets, but I was gonna talk about venue selection. So um, I think uh, Dr. Jacobs used the phrase lower tier and these things, uh, conferences and, and journals uh, do have reputations. Uh, and that's one thing you may want to consider. Uh, generally, the more, the higher the reputation, the more selective, the harder it is to get in. Um, this is something that your advisor or your peers can, of course, now it's my turn to get the spam call. Um, hang on. Sorry, and um, so you can look at things like impact factor. Impact factor is uh, uh, sort of the average number of times an article is cited and most of the journals, especially the ones that are uh, not run by the professional societies, they will brag about their impact factor if they have a, a reasonable one. Uh, you, you might wanna check the acceptance rate, like in networking, in my field, uh, you know, the, the, 
the top conferences have uh, an acceptance rate probably between 15 and 20 percent. Um, the fit for your topic uh, is, is probably one of the most important things uh, because that determines the likelihood that whoever's refereeing it uh, will sort of get what you're doing and, and be an expert in, in what you're doing. Uh, another, another factor, another aspect is the double blind aspect. I think in networking, a lot of the conferences now are doing double blind uh, reviewing where the reviewers in theory at least don't know who the author is. Um, you know, the traditional progression was sort of conference paper and then journal paper. Today, uh, for almost any area you're working in, there's probably a workshop uh, that, um, that, you know, focuses on that area. And so now a lot of times people do workshop and then conference paper. And in the systems area in the last 20 years, you know, the importance of journal papers has, uh, I would, I have to say declined. A lot of people don't submit to, don't turn their conference papers into journals. And uh, I personally think this is a problem um, because Conferences uh, are driven by deadlines, both the submissions and the reviewers, and that means that uh, people don't always take time to go back and, and fix things up. So um, I, I do think, and every once in a while at the, uh, the CRA's uh, biannual conference of, of computer science department chairs, the CRA is a computing research association, um, there's some kind of introspection about should we be more like other fields where journal publication is the standard and, and conferences are just for, you know, seeing people in your field. So that, that's another aspect of, of thinking about which venue you want to go to is uh, what's your purpose, right? Is it to get a publication to put on your Vita? Is it to get to know people in your field? Um, is it multiple things? Um, Different conferences have different personalities. In networking, uh, there's an ACM conference that has a distinctly different personality than the IEEE large conference. Uh, um, yeah, okay. So then uh, I wanted to say a couple of words about rejection. So everybody gets rejected, as far as I know, at some point. And uh, I have, I think, three points on that. One is that you should focus on, of course, it's going to hurt if your paper gets rejected, uh, but you should focus on the facts. And, and did the reviewers make good points in their reviews? And if it's a quality venue, you should get reviews that will help you improve the paper no matter what, whether, that, whether it's accepted or rejected. Um, so don't focus on, oh, they didn't like it, but rather... How do I, what do I need to do to make this better? Uh, what did I miss? Are their criticisms valid? Uh, and even if the answer is they didn't quite get what you were at, then you need to ask yourself, okay, how can I, why did they miss it? How, how can I make it more clear? So the, the point there is you gotta be the, the pickiest reviewer before you submit to the extent that you can, right? Um, and this is one reason why uh, conferences maybe are an easier target because there's a deadline where you have to say, okay, now, now it's done. It's got to go in by, you know, midnight on this date. The second thing is you got to remember there's randomness in the system, okay? And um, there's always going to be a, a random variable about who on the program committee or which reviewers get to review your paper. You won't know that. Um, but when I was at NSF, there were uh, sometimes natural experiments where the same, this was for proposals, not papers, but I know the same thing happens with, with uh, publications. Uh, the same things would get reviewed by different panels and the outcomes would be different, right? So uh, sometimes that's going to help you and sometimes it's, 
it's going to hurt you. But it's not the case that every paper that gets accepted is objectively better than it, than every paper that got rejected. So you need to keep that in mind. In mind. And then the third point about that is that the randomness can sometimes help you. So um, there's a large conference in networking and I personally experienced a fair amount of randomness. And so it became my strategy to submit the papers that I didn't think were quite as good there because I thought the randomness was more likely to help me than, than hurt me. And I actually did benefit from that uh, a few times. Um, Above all, don't be discouraged if you, if you get rejected. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to say about the process is that in networking, uh, it's pretty common now for ex every accepted paper to have a shepherd appointed from the program committee. And their job is to kind of help you and to just serve as a final check to make sure that the uh, reviewer's comments are taken into, a, in, into account to the extent that it's feasible to do that. Um, and sometimes there's even a conditional acceptance that says you got to do this, these particular things, or this is not getting in. And then the shepherd has the final say about that. And then the last thing I wanted to suggest was, uh, this is not just about getting a thing, uh, getting an item for your Vita. Um, it's also about joining a community. So uh, these venues, have their their communities in your area uh, that you're working in will there, there will be a group of people and you want to get known by them as well as getting to know them and some of the ways you can do that for for conferences and workshops uh, is to volunteer to help out there are always jobs like uh, webmaster and publicity chair and those kind of things and a lot of times students can can help out with those, especially if your advisor is involved in the conference uh, in some way. So uh, don't be afraid to volunteer to take on some some job. Of course, you got to do a good job uh, if you do that, but it's a, it's a good way to get to know the community. Um, and then some conferences have shadow program committees uh, made up of students where they actually review uh, the papers that were submitted to the conference and uh, kind of simulate the process so that you get to see the thing from the other side. And that's a really good thing to do if you, if you have, an, um, have an opportunity. So I guess that's about all I wanted to say. Wow, my field does not have shepherds and we don't have shadow student committees, but those are fabulous ideas. Ah, so in the AI conferences, there are complete scholarships for volunteers. If you put in 10 hours at the conference, I'm not sure 10 is the right number, you get free admission. Yeah, and um, in networking, if you're working at the conference, say manning the or, or staffing the registration desk, uh, typically you'll get uh, free admission, at least for that day, if not for the whole thing. Um, nowadays, of course, in my experience, registration fees are trivial, so there's not really that much. In fact, I'm co-program chair of a conference coming up in a couple of weeks, and students are free in that, for that conference. Uh, so there's not much to do. And I'll, I'll throw one more thing in there that the computer vision community has been doing, which is to reward outstanding reviewers with free admissions uh, to the conferences. So, so they've done a few things like that, um, that, you know, start trying to address the challenge of, you know, that reviewers are putting in a lot of unpaid work and it's not something they get recognition for. And so, you know, with, um, the desire to keep the quality of reviews high, you start incentivizing people in, in different ways. So. And then uh, there's a question here uh, in the chat. Can someone speak to the use of project web pages which complement publications or archive? It seems like a lot to manage. It's the same work can have an archive version, a website, and a publication. 
Um, and I can talk a little bit about that um, because we've been trying to do more of that. Um, you know, typically a paper, a lot of papers will have, you know, a web page that is generally fairly short and there's some standard templates that people use for that. Um, and they'll have a link to the paper, a link to the code, um, you know, pictures, you know, maybe additional results. Um, and a lot of that is to encourage people to be excited about your work and potentially want to use your code in their project so that then they will cite your work and it will you know, become more important because other people are building upon it. And so I think a lot of that, you know, that effort will go in there with the idea that you want to get more attention to your work, make it, you know, it's why people will put in a lot of effort to make really, really clean um, code bases that they share via GitHub, um, but also seeing more examples of people releasing things like Google Colab notebooks, so Jupyter notebooks that are, you know, you can run in the cloud that demonstrate the approach on some real data so that all you have to do is like double click on it. You can run it, you can see it working, uh, you can manipulate it. Um, so um, in addition to that, um, you know, with all of these virtual conferences, we've been having to make a lot of one minute and five minute videos that go along with the paper. Um, and so, you know, that's not stuff that we did before, but now that we are being forced to do all of those things, it makes it easier to throw together the quick web page. Um, because you've got content to put on that page. But all those things I think are just useful from a marketing perspective. Um, and, you know, it's, as long as you're, you know, you're not sort of trying to invent all of it from scratch, you can copy and paste a lot of the templates that other people are using for that, so. Also, um, you know, the funding agency may require you to have a, um, project web page, which is a, just a good place to collect all your publications and videos and all the stuff. And the other thing I was going to mention is badging in, in networking. And I think in other systems areas, I don't know if this is true in the vision area, but place in uh, areas that involve implementations and experiments, there's a push to get people to really make their uh, code available after there have been some well publicized uh, studies where people tried to reproduce results. So that this is goes under the general heading of uh, reproducibility or replication or um, repeatability of your experiments. And uh, some some venues now are uh, recognizing, uh, for example, the ACM Internet Measurement Conference, uh, they, they give you a badge in the program, your, your paper gets a badge if, you're, if you submit the uh, code uh, at the at same time as the camera ready. Um, and I think that's a really good idea because I do think our field has kind of a problem with this reproducibility thing. So, Let me Please. Yeah. yeah, let me just mention that uh, back already in 1980, I was at a conference where there was the suggestion made that papers should all be always be associated with working code. And people from companies said, well, we can't do that because the, our code is proprietary, but it's a good idea otherwise. And ever since then, I've always tried to make all of my code publicly available for the very reasons that Ken has given. So, as of this year, I think, the big AI conferences are allowing submission of code with the submission of paper in case reviewers want to check. I will be very interested to see whether the review, any of the reviewers do. Reviewers typically get a month in which, three to four weeks in which to review three to 10 papers. And so reviews may be fabulous, but they aren't always. I also wanted to mention an experiment that a conference now called NeurIPS did a few years ago, where they took a certain percentage of the papers and sent them to two groups of reviewers, two independent separate groups of reviewers and compared how much 
agreement there was and on the accepts, there's about 50% agreement. So half the papers that one group said should be accepted, the other group said reject. So I just want to say, yes, there's a great deal of randomness in this process. It is not ideal. Yeah, I always, for conferences, and again, you know, the advantage of journals is you can sort of iterate and uh, there's more time, although it does, and I will say that having been a, you know, when I was a journal editor, I had papers that it took more than a year to get the results back. I'm not proud of that, but it, it's a fact. Uh, but in conferences, it's sort of the, the top, you know, the best 10 papers, it's clear which, which ones those are. And sort of the bottom 30% or 40% of the papers, it's pretty clear those, which ones those are that shouldn't get in. It's the ones in the middle, that's where the randomness is. And I've, you know, I've kind of only semi uh, kidding suggested for years that the, they should just identify those two top and bottom classes and then, then just have a lottery for the things in the middle because then everybody knows uh, exactly what's going on and there's no, you know, there's no second guessing. I don't think it's going to happen, but um, I still think it's a good idea. So one of the questions, I'm happy to spend the next 10 minutes on audience questions if you have, but if not, I've got a couple of other things queued up. Yeah. So I guess so, uh, just to, to answer the, the question in the chat from Stephen, so does, does anyone try to keep a pulse on venues outside of their area or is it hard enough to stay up to date with your own field? Um, I know me personally, you know, you, you see fields that feed in to your field. Um, and so with computer vision there, you know, you sort of see things that come out in the machine learning community, you know, ICML or NeurIPS, um, those might, you know, at least when I was a grad student, those were coming out maybe the year before. And then the year after there were the CVPR papers that used those techniques. And so I think that's generally what the advice that I would give would be to see where there are ideas that could flow into your field um, where you can, you know, it's a little bit of an arbitrage situation where you can take advantage of things that you're seeing in this other field, apply them to your field. Um, and so, you know, which ones I pay attention to has changed over the years, but I think um, you certainly, it's really hard to stay on top of, completely on top of it, but if you can have that quick filter to find the really useful things in the other field that you think will really have an impact, um, then that's a good thing to do. So, sorry. So, so I have a question about uh, uh, the rebuttal process. So, what 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 a uh, what a situation could be we have a chance to rebuttal what a situation we just don't rebuttal just in case people don't like kind of remember our work and in future kind of reject every time like that like that i'm kind of uh, just uh, don't know what's a boundary so the rebuttal process is supposed to be for correcting reviewers who have misunderstood what's in your paper. That's not necessarily how it's used, but that's the idea, is in case somebody completely misread something. I see it used to say, oh yes, you're right, we should have done this and we will do that if it's accepted, we will put that in the paper. That's not the intent. So, uh, so I, I can say a little bit about about that. So the there there are typically three reviews that come out. Um, then you get to look at the reviews, and for us, we'll typically get to write a one-page PDF that we submit back. That um, that will then be discussed by the reviewers, and they can update their reviews accordingly. 
uh, if that somehow changes their mind. And then all of that, the updated reviews and the rebuttal gets submitted uh, you know, onward to somebody else. In, in our case, they're called area chairs. Um, and they get to make the decision on what gets accepted or not in consultation with a couple of other area chairs. So when you write the rebuttal, I think it's important to just understand that process and to think about what your arguments are trying to accomplish. Right. And so we, we will read very carefully the reviews. And, you know, if we, for example, we see two reviewers that agree with us and one of them that clearly got something wrong, then we'll sort of structure our rebuttal to try to encourage the discussion that happens during the review revision process to be the two reviewers will cause that other reviewer to change their reviews. Right. And so you really have to think about it like a debate where you just get to throw one statement back and you, you're trying to influence this process to change. So you want the individual reviewers to all up their reviews. Barring that, you want the area chair to ignore the ridiculous review. Um, because there might be, you know, there's always reviewer number two who gives you a ridiculous review that makes no sense. Um, and so, you know, it's, we always you know, really strategize exactly how we write that rebuttal and often iterate on that almost as much as the final draft of the paper. Um, Anyway, that's um, a little bit from from our perspective. Thank you. Um, so I thought the question was, part of the question was, should you always submit a rebuttal or is it, could it be harmful if you don't submit a rebuttal? Uh, um, I, I sometimes just feel maybe it would be hurt because if I submit a rebuttal or uh, they were discussed and uh, my work is very specific. Next time they say the same thing and remember my rebuttal, maybe not proper. And <laughs> they will just reject me from uh, specific individual reasons like that. Well, so I think, I mean, if, if you're, you know, you don't want to write an obnoxious rebuttal that, that could have, a, but I think you kind of have to trust that the reviewers are, have good intentions and, uh, it could just as likely help you. I, my, my having had a fairly not good experience with rebuttals a long time ago. I, I, my philosophy is don't spend too much time on it. Don't agonize over it because I think that the likelihood of it really making a huge difference is is not that big. Uh, but I do think you should take advantage of the opportunity. And I like Nathan's idea about you know, thinking how you could shape the discussion. Uh, but always be polite and, and thank the reviewers for their comments. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, um, the one thing where it can hurt is during that review discussion process, um, it's really easy for reviewers to say, there was no rebuttal, so I'm gonna just stick with the reviews that I submitted before. And that's a pretty default thing if there's no rebuttal or they may even like look at some of the other reviews and see problems that they didn't point out and they might lower their review. And so I think if you think that there's a chance for the work to be accepted, um, then it, you definitely want to write a rebuttal. Um, but often people will, will get the reviews back. They know there's no chance for it to be accepted given the you know, fatal flaws that the reviewers discovered. So then people will just pull that out of the review process. Um, and then in that case, it's not really worth writing rebuttal because you, you, know, you know it's done because you want to submit it somewhere else quickly. I see. So I have uh, another question about uh, subsidiary because I had experience about submitting uh, AAA AI. There are a bunch of uh, questions uh, in the uh, question. When you submit, there are a bunch of questions to ask about uh, uh, reproducibility or like, uh, um, I mean, uh, some related that kind of question. So my question is specific, like uh, if I happen to understand uh, wrongly about the question, the way they ask, and uh, I choose yes or no, or not applicable wrongly, does this could potentially hurt my um, accept, acceptance or um, like that? So I'm going to jump in here. Those questions are new this year. There is no data to answer that. So. Okay. I, I just uh, kind of afraid of those questions. So maybe they just are going to not going to look at your papers, just, just throw it in other stack. 
I'll let you know what I find out after the reviewing process is over. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So one, one thing that I think is an important decision that you get to make generally when you're submitting will be what um, topic area you specify. So, you know, there's often a list of primary subject areas that you get to select. I think that's one of the most important decisions, although, you know, I don't have enough data points to really be confident in this. I feel like it's important um, because certain sub-communities of reviewers will have very different expectations, right? So some sets of reviewers might really, really want to see um, extensive theoretical derivations for something. Some might want to see a lot of empirical evidence. Um, and so figuring out which community of people you want to review your work, uh, that's the choice. That's one of the more important choices, I think, in the, the review paper submission process. Beyond just the macro sort of which conference do you submit to, it's which subsets of people uh, within that conference do you want to look at your paper. Any last questions? Well, I want to thank our three panelists for today's quite enlightening discussion. And I'm glad to say that it is being all recorded. So this will be available again in the future. Uh, um, if there are no more questions, uh, we can uh, uh, call it a keeping current session done and invite you to the next one, which will be uh, we have already scheduled for next week, uh, Margaret Sturgill, who will, who's an alumna from many years ago, who will tell us about what it's like to have finished here and to, gone on to, and to have gone on to the real world. So we'll learn about the real world, which I define as any place you are not at the moment. Uh, <laughs> right, so thank you all for being here and uh, stay safe and keep current. Thanks, bye. Thank you.